wrapped up, this will be the most significant accomplishment of my life. Great. Except for having my kids. That's <laughs> of course. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Good. And well, good evening. Welcome to Media Reporter. My name is Nicole Israel. Thank you for joining us this evening. Tonight we have Professor Michael Perlin here at New York Law School. Welcome, Professor Perlin. Thank you, Nicole. And we'll be talking about uh, international human rights and specifically mental disability rights. Right. Um, so, uh, but first, I'm wondering if you could just elaborate mm. or distinguish between international human rights and mental disability rights. Well, it's, it's a great question, Nikki, because the fact that that question has to be asked, and it's the right question to ask, is very, very important. There have been, as you know, international human rights, some say since forever, but we know since the United Nations was created, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was written up in 1948, and this, of course, was in the aftermath of the Holocaust. There is no question about that. And, you know, over the years, there have been new covenants on civil rights, on political rights, on economic rights, on social rights. But oddly, strangely, the traditional human rights groups, the NGOs, like Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International, the people who write to you three times a week asking for a contribution, were never interested in cases involving people with mental disabilities. They would say, we're into human rights, we're not into mental disability rights. And what's the subtext of that? that people with mental disability aren't human. Uh, I spent the first 13 years of my career as a real lawyer practicing law in New Jersey. For most of that time, I was director of the Division of Mental Health Advocacy, which is a state-run, state-funded office to provide legal services to people with mental disabilities. I came to New York Law School. I started to teach. I started to uh, write in this area. Wrote a, I write a lot, as you know. And, uh, but it was always domestic. In the year 2000, uh, Eric Rosenthal, who runs Disability Rights International, which is the most prominent U.S.-based NGO in this area, asked me if I would go to Hungary to do some work there, to do some site visits and to run advocacy seminars. I did, and my entire life changed. It was one of those oh-my-God moments. Uh, and then later that year, in December, uh, Ava Selly, who is an, a, an adjunct professor here who teaches the International Human Rights and Mental Disability Law course with me, uh, Ava and I met in uh, Tallinn, Estonia, and we worked in Estonia, in Latvia, going to psychiatric institutions and doing other things, and I was hooked. And for the last 13 years, the, the, the greatest part of my advocacy work, almost all my pro bono work, has been done in the area of international human rights. We created this course at the law school, International Human Rights and Mental Disability Law. As you know, I've written a lot about it. And uh, the Disability Rights Tribunal that we'll be talking about is in a lot of ways a culmination of all that work that we did. And one of the reasons that we've done, to go back to your original question, is that pe mental disability law rights were always kind of under the rug. People didn't care about them. In, in the year 2000, I wrote a book called The Hidden Prejudice, Mental Disability on Trial. Two years ago, I wrote this book, International Human Rights and Mental Disability Law, When the Silenced Are Heard hidden, silenced, it's the same thing. This is a population that people don't know about, don't care about, don't think about. And I think one of my roles is saying to people, saying to the TV audience, saying to whoever I speak to, this is important. These are individuals who have rights, have human rights, and around the globe they are sadly being abused, in some cases in horrible, horrible circumstances. Well, why is there such a lack of a mental disability law? Uh, well, I mean, it's interesting. When we, we started doing our research, we found how many nations had no mental disability law at all. And others may have had one on the books, but, I mean, in fact, when, when Ava and I went to Estonia, uh, you know the first rule of uh, cross-examination, don't ask a question you don't know the answer to. And when I was a trial lawyer, I did that. But I, I, I did something, which I wasn't sure how it was going to come out, but I was pretty sure. I said, we're at the State Psychiatric Hospital in Estonia, and the Attorney General who represented the hospitals was in the room with us. And I said to her, I said, you know, I'd like it, I'd really appreciate it if you could go and get me a copy of the Estonian Mental Disability Law. Well, it was a bluff because I don't read any Estonian. Mm -hmm. She comes back in half an hour, she said, I'm sorry, Professor, nobody knows where it is. So this is a law that she, her job is to enforce, and nobody knew where the law was. When I did a lot of work in Nicaragua. The entire mental disability law there, hold your piece of paper up to the camera. It was about a third of that piece of paper was the entire law. There are many nations, and not just nations with developing economies. There are many nations, many first world nations, that have no mental disability law. Why? Because there's no market for it. 
There are no real, there's, in many nations, there's no advocacy movement. And I think in a lot of ways, most importantly, and people accuse me of being very lawyer-centric, there in many nations are no lawyers to represent this population. And one of the things, as we'll get into, when we talk about uh, the Disability Rights Tribunal, is that I am building into that a section that provides for counsel. So I believe, and this is really, I'm, I'm a musician too, so I'll say it's my C major chord, if you know what I mean. My C major chord of all of this is, it's absolutely fatuous to think we are going to make any improvement in the world, no matter what statutes we write up, no matter what tribunals we create, unless we have lawyers on the ground who are there to provide legal representation, not just in the mega case that makes headlines and you know pictures taken on the courthouse steps, but the individual case. You need lawyers for both, and I think without that, it's pretty hopeless. Okay. Now, just in the broad scheme of things, there, there's much case law in the international realm for some of the first world regions, right. but there's one region I think that was lacking, which you know you concentrate on, which is the Asian that's correct. region. Why is Asia so so lack? That, that's that's such an important question. And it's such a good question. I mean, it's kind of interesting. Back in the early 1950s, I think 54, the European Court on Human Rights was created. The European Commission that later became the court. Then in the 70s, uh, there was an inter-American court in South America. Then in the 1980s or early 90s, there was a commission in Africa, but nothing in Asia. There's a lot of reasons. One of the, the reason that is bandied about, and I reject this, is that, quote, Asian values are different than Western values. I believe that the basic values of human rights to be treated with dignity, to not be treated with prejudice, to not be tortured, to not receive cruel and unusual punishment, to have your day in court, to have a right to be heard, I believe those are universal rights that apply to every human being in the world. The whole notion of Asian values, and I've done a lot of sort of study and research about this, seems to me that in, at one point in the 1980s, the prime ministers or the premiers of Malaysia, Singapore, and Indonesia, all of whom were very, very powerful men, and I say men pointedly, and wanted to maintain and retain their power, set, rejecting some documents that this does not comport with Asian values. And that kind of became the meme for all of this. I've spent much time in many Asian nations. I haven't been in all, but I've been in a lot. I've been to Asia 25 or 30 times over the past eight years, say. And I've never spoken to a young person. I've never spoken to a person who, I've never spoken to a woman. I've never spoken to an out gay male. I've never spoken to a person of a religious or an ethnic minority who said, yes, those values that these men espoused are my values. By saying, you know, there's a set of Asian values, that tells us that people whose background is Confucianism, Shintoism, Buddhism, uh, Muslimism, and all Christianity, I mean, those all agree on everything. Well, you know how foolish that is. Mm -hmm. The point is, one, I think that argument is just not so. I think there's always said that Asia is, is afraid because so much of Asia was colonized, which is true. But of course, look at Africa, how colonized Africa was. Look at how colonized South America and Central America were. And the nations there realized that if they created a tribunal, a commission, a court to, to, to deal with human rights issues, this would get people on the ground a way of having their grievances heard. Asia, you know, ASEAN is, you know, is, is, is in Asia, uh, the Asian Society of Nations. It's about 10 nations or 12, but it, it's pretty toothless. And it never touches on human rights. They're very concerned clearly about economic issues and economic growth. But I believe that if you take the long haul, granting human rights is an economic boon. It's not an economic deficit. And I've talked to my class about that. I said, you know, imagine that you had a factory, you know, and you had a choice of putting it in two different nations. Would you want to put it in a nation where people are abused? Or would you want to put it in a nation where people are treated with dignity? And mm -hmm. I think that's a good question to ask, you know. Uh, so we've, we've, we've kind of got all of that on the table on one hand. And the other reality is this, and we, and we know this. Without, and now I'm not talking solely about uh, disability cases, but just generally, without a human rights commission, it is very, very unlikely that the high courts of many of the nations in any region of the world would enter the kinds of orders that regional human rights courts and commissions do. In other words, uh, there have been, uh, out of the Inter-American Commission, a case out of Ecuador, the Victor Rosario Congo case, of which found this man was... was stripped naked and was beaten to death in an institution. These are horrible, horrible cases. 
uh, and the, the court found that it violated international law and made, a, made the government of Ecuador pay his family a money sum. Uh, in Paraguay, one of the hidden nations, uh, the Inter-American Court signed off on, a, on, on an agreement which would close down the neuropsychiatric institution in Paraguay, which is a horrible, horrible facility to create community housing for people. No one in their right mind would stare at me and say, oh, Professor Perlin, the High Court of Paraguay or the High Court of Ecuador would have done that. When the African Commission on Human Rights in Tarawit and Moore versus the Gambia ruled that Gambian rules violate international human rights law, what are the odds that the Gambian High Court would have done the same thing? Zero. Mm -hmm. Well, what you have in Asia now is high courts like that, and they're not implementing human rights either on a domestic or an international level. So we believe that it is important, essential, that there be an international tribunal in Asia. We are, what we are offering now, and what I've been writing about, and what I've been lecturing all over the world about, is the need to create a disability rights tribunal for Asia and the Pacific, and it's only one piece. I mean, there are many other rights. There's issues involving women, issues involving indigenous people, issues involving gays, issues involving children. You know, you can run the whole list off. This is what I know about, this is what I can do, and I believe if we do this, it'll be the foot in the door. And once this happens, then Asia will not be in the position of no, no, never. They're gonna to have to start thinking about how they can implement human rights across the board. At first, um, I can be a little bit grandiose sometimes. Okay, we'll do this for all of Asia right away. And I realized that that was kind of silly. First of all, Asia is so huge. You know, and many parts of Asia have very little to do with other parts of Asia. So we are starting this as a sub-regional group. And it would include, we hope, the Pacific Rim, inland to Thailand, the Philippines, Australia, and New Zealand. We're sort of not ready for the others. I've never been to any of the Stans, and I, I simply don't know. I could not tell you today the difference between, I know about Kyrgyzstan because a colleague of mine did some work there, but if you were to ask me the difference between how people are treating Uzbekistan and Tajikistan, I couldn't give you a coherent answer. I've spent quite a bit of time in Israel, I've been in Turkey, but issues in the Middle East and that part of Asia are entirely different. So we are starting out with this part, hopefully it will have legs, and hopefully it will expand to other parts. Well, why is this the perfect time to have this uh, tribunal, and, and what are some of the challenges you think you'll be facing as you start to develop this? Well, timing is everything, as you know. Uh, and uh, in, the, in 2008, the United Nations ratified uh, the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. It was the fastest time of ratification from introduction to ratification of any treaty in the history of the United Nations. And now, I, I didn't check this morning, about 150, 160 nations have ratified us. Sadly, not the United States. President Obama signed it two years ago. Uh, everything was set to, for ratification in December, and uh, it needs a two-thirds vote. And it got, I think, 61 or 62 votes. Uh, it had bipartisan support. Uh, every Democrat voted for it. Some Republicans voted for it. But other Republicans were told President Dole, uh, ex-Vice ex President Dole, uh, who is now in a wheelchair, who is a person with a disability, that they were going to vote for it. They lied and did not vote for it. Uh, Harry Reid has said he's going to bring it up again this year, and I'm hopeful that the shame that has come to some of those who voted against it will get them to change their mind. But the fact that it has been signed by so many nations means it's in good currency, and it is the current state of what the law is or should be. And even in nations that have not ratified it should act in accordance with it. I mean, even though the United States hasn't ratified it, we've ratified the Vienna Convention. I don't know if you've had international law or not, but you know that once you sign the international, uh, sign the Vienna Convention, you then agree that any convention that is signed by the president, but before ratification, when it's in that kind of cusp area, mm -hmm. the nation must, act, must act in ways that are not inimical, inimical to the purpose and the spirit of the treaty. Uh, Judge Kristen Booth Glenn uh, who just retired as surrogate of New York State, she was a, an adjunct professor here for many years, I so hope she comes back, has written two opinions in the matter of Mark C.H. in the matter of Demaris R., which involve guardianships. And she used in the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities to help buttress her argument that the guardianships were improper or whatever. We know now that the United States Supreme Court, this is an answer to the question, why is the time right? We know the United States Supreme Court, which is very contentious, obviously, is more interested in international human rights law than it ever was before. If you look at the decisions of Lawrence versus Texas, the consensual sodomy case, 
Roper v. Simmons, uh, the juvenile execution case, Graham versus Florida, the juvenile life with, without parole case, and uh, Edwards v. Alabama, the juvenile life without parole for non-homicide case. Those four cases, time after time in those cases, the majority looks to other international human rights laws in support. It's not the holding, it's supportive of the holding. Mm -hmm. And uh, tremendous blowback from Justice Scalia on that. I mean, there's a huge, huge fight. And Justice Kennedy, who is, as you know, is a law student, the guy in the middle, he's the most powerful man in America, he is the one who is always the strongest in using international human rights law. And I take that as a very, very good omen, you know? Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I think the timing is right. The, the uh, ratification in many of the Asian countries, not all, but in many, of the CRPD, uh, I think the fact that in the U.S., the U.N.'s, the, the United States Supreme Court's interest in, uh, in, 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 in U.N. documents is important. And we also know that finally, and this is important, on the ground there are advocacy groups in Africa, in Asia especially, that we didn't hear of 10, 20 years ago. Some of these are groups of people with disabilities themselves. Some are people who call themselves psychiatric survivors but there are other people with physical disabilities. I mean, my stress is clearly on mental disabilities, but this convention covers all disabilities. It covers people with any kind of disability, mental or physical. And the convention very carefully and very purposely, and I think very cleverly, did not define disability so as not to allow people to win over the way and say, oh, we don't mean that, we don't mean this, we're not talking about that. It's very, very expansive. Mm -hmm. And now there are groups on the ground in these parts of the world, and we think that will be a great help. Uh, I am a friend of a woman who is a UN official in Thailand, and she is trying to kind of do some work there to get the Thai people interested in it. I've spoken about this uh, tribunal uh, in Taiwan, in mainland China, in Japan, in Thailand, in Hong Kong, in Korea, in Australia, in New Zealand. I'm sure I've forgotten somewhere, mm. but it's a lot, and it's, and it's more than frequent fire miles. You know, it's a, going to different places, talking to different people at all levels. It's some I'll talk to government officials, some I'll talk to professors, some I'll talk to people on the street, some I'll talk to people who have been institutionalized. Uh, in, in many of my trips, uh, the, I used to do a lot of this work in Central and South America, and as I said, in Central and Eastern Europe. I've also done work in Africa. I've spent time in psychiatric institutions working with patients there. I've not done that to this point in, 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 in Asia, but I hope to in the future. Do you see that our people with mental disabilities being treated now before Asia does have possibly a high court or, you know, some form of a system that can, you know, govern different varying cases? I'll give you a good law professor's answer. It depends. It depends on the disability. It depends on the person. And it also depends on the person's status in the community. Uh, there is a huge difference between upper middle class people in a big city like Tokyo or Beijing and people who are out in the countryside in China, what are called the Wild West provinces. Mm -hmm. uh, I've just come back uh, from a, a wonderful, wonderful experience. Uh, I was uh, a Fulbright senior specialist and I taught in Indonesia in October. That was so cool. And uh, it was very interesting and I, 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 I consulted with a clinic. I was at an Islamic law school, the Islamic uh, University of Indonesia in Yogyakarta and I spent uh, several days uh, consulting with uh, the clinic that represented people with disabilities. And even there, it was so interesting, the difference between people in Jakarta, which is the capital, or Yogyakarta, which is the university city, and those in some of the islands far away where virtually nobody is literate. Mm -hmm. You know, and sort of, what do you do? Uh, if you were to come to my office, uh, you would see my screen, you know, my, my screensaver and my home computer is exactly what you expect, pictures of my kids and, you know, pictures of fish that I've caught, whatever. But my screensaver here that comes on is from a trip I took to Nicaragua, a tiny town up in the mountains that does not show up on any of the maps. I mean, you can't get there from here. And we went to do work with this woman with her two, I will say children, because they were her offspring, but they were adults. Uh, one of them was a, a, the male, and they were both in their 20s. He, had, he, he was mentally retarded and the woman, the girl was mentally ill, and the mother did not know what to do. When the boy went to town, he would get into fights. When the girl went to town, she would be sexually assaulted. She was a very attractive girl who was almost mute, and she was fair game for the hoodlums in town. Mm -hmm. So what does she do? And she had a disability. So she talked to her priest, and she talked to the town mayor, and they said, lock them up in cages. And so these two people are locked up in cages 
in the back of the house, and that's my screensaver. So every student who comes to see me, whether they want to talk about civil procedure, criminal procedure, or international human rights law, well, that's what they see. You know, I believe this happens all over. I was on the phone yesterday with a friend of mine in South Africa talking about how this goes down in Africa, and I said I had done some work in Uganda. He said, Michael, that's a picnic compared to some of the other countries. Mm -hmm. And you know, for the record, your eyebrows just went up, right? Um, so in Asia, so it is the same thing. It depends where you are. It depends if you are the member of the prevailing religion, if you're a member of, if you have money. But people who are not rich, people who are poor, they are treated terribly. In many places, it is believed that if you are mentally ill, it is a payment by the devil for sins that you or your parents or your grandparents committed. People are tied to trees. The kinds of things that if it was on a, you know, you saw it as a trailer for a movie at the movie theater, you said, oh, come on, this can't be real. But unfortunately, it is. Not everywhere, of course. Uh, and in the big cities, uh, I've done work in Japan and in, in Seoul, Korea, with people who are ex-patients who have sort of formed together in groups, and it's very exciting working with them. But, you know, it's in the big cities. It's in the metropolitan areas. It's where people wear ties and jackets and, you know, attractive dresses. It's not... So just going forward now, now you're developing this um, group at the school for, for in the coming months. Right. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and how that's uh, going in, in oh, the... Oh, sure, sure. Uh, three years ago, I, 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 I'm going to go back and sort of how did this whole thing come to be, the tribunal. Yes. Uh, Yoshi Ikahara, who I mentioned before, I believe, is head of the Tokyo Advocacy Law Office. I met Yoshi 13 years ago, and as you know, uh, as I, I would expect any of your viewers who are part of the New York Law School community know, we have an online mental disability law program here we have for 13 different courses, which is more than any other law school in the world offers. And uh, back in 2001, 2002, I offered a section of one of our courses in Japan with Yoshi as the head there. Mm -hmm. 2002 to four, we offered another section of another course. I went back and forth to, to Japan many, many times to work with Yoshi and his colleagues on legislative drafting, on advocacy issues, everything. About six years ago, seven years ago, I don't know how many, maybe five, Yoshi and I are at a conference in Taiwan, and we are finishing up an absolutely wonderful dim sum dinner at the end of the conference, and we're talking, the conference is over, and we're going to fly home the next day. I said, so Yoshi, what's your dream? He said, Michael, my dream is to create a disability rights tribunal for Asia. I said, so let's do it. And literally, I mean, I mean, people laugh at this, but it was like, you know, a 30-second decision, you know, made over, 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 over a cup of tea, maybe a glass of sake, mm -hmm. and uh, we decided to start working on it, and we've been working on it ever since. He got a grant from the to uh, Toyota Foundation for the first kind of startup money, and we've had meetings in Japan, have had meetings in Hong Kong and Korea and in China. Uh, he's now looking for supplemental funding, and the idea is that this would be a tribunal, it would be a voluntary tribunal at start. And actually, I was a little surprised by that, but then I went and, you know, did some research and I found how many of the UN tribunals, how many of the international tribunals, like the law of the seas, which involves big money, as you can imagine, is voluntary. Uh, they're not compulsory. So we would start this as voluntary, hoping it would become obligatory afterwards, and we would start out for a piece. You asked me about my students, and this is really in prelude. So we had this idea, but what are we going to do with it? About four years ago, three or four years ago, then Associate Dean Steve Ellman came up with the brilliant idea, I think, to try to offer more experiential courses for New York Law School students beyond those few students who could take the clinics. And I remember, oh, you know how you remember things? My wife and I go up to Cape Cod every summer for a couple weeks, and I'm sitting out on the deck of the cottage in Cape Cod wanting to go into the kayak and fish again, but Steve called me, so yeah, he was my boss, so I talked to him. I love him. And he said, Michael, are you interested in being part of this faculty? I said, sign me up, you know, put me in coach. I want to play center field. And three years ago, we, start, we had our first project-based learning course in which students worked with me to create the blueprint of the tribunal. And a shout out to Naomi Weinstein, who was my research assistant, I don't know what year, maybe been 09, 10, I think, I'm, I'm fuzzy on the years. And so much of the, fine, of the blueprint of the panel, and I write about that in this article, is Naomi's idea. The next year, we decided we wanted to do more. We had the blueprint, but there were all these details. And one of the things I teach is civil procedure. When I, I know how annoying that is to tell a law student, but I do. <laughs> and, but one of the things when you teach civil procedure, you always have to be aware of detail, right? Mm -hmm. And so, who has standing? 
What's the role of NGOs? What kind of remedies are there going to be? What is the GASP jurisdiction? So this next year when I taught my project-based learning class, I had about six students, and I, gave, I assigned maybe nine or ten different substantive topics, and I had to like, say two students for this, three for this, two for this, and they gave me a series of white papers in which we now have, and this is all sitting on my hard drive, uh, sort of the answer of what the role of the NGO should be, how judges should be selected, all of these. The students did an absolutely heroic job. Now, one of the pieces of the tribunal uh, is the creation of a disability rights information center for Asia and the Pacific. And this idea was all Yoshi's. I take no credit for this one at all. Uh, Nikki, I mean, let's say you wanted to go and you wanted to research a topic of what, what, what kind of law do you think you're going to want to practice? Do you have any I would idea love yet? to know more about human rights or oh, international law. But tell sure. me something domestic for the purposes of this hypo. Uh, criminal law. Okay, great. So Nikki wants to do criminal law, and I'm your professor, and I assign you a topic. And what you do is you go to Westwall, and you look up, and you look to see what statutes there are. You look to see what cases there are. And then you go to JLR, and you look to see who's written law review articles about it. And after a couple of hours, you're going to have a very good idea about what is there to write about this topic, what is there to research, or if you're working for a law firm and the senior partner says, Nikki, I have this really odd question about Miranda that never seems to have been addressed in New York before, what's the story? And you'll go and you'll find that two or three professors wrote about it, and there's a case in California that goes one way, a case in Florida goes the other way. That's easy. You can't do that in Asia. There is no one-stop shop, sit at your desk, sipping on your tea, and plugging it in. It doesn't exist. We at New York Law School are creating that. And uh, Heather Kuklo, who I understand you interviewed earlier, uh, and who works with me in the online program, she teaches several courses. When I've been on sabbatical, she's been the acting director. Heather is the person tasked with running this disability, this information center. It's going to be a one-stop shop that it's going to have, not for every Asian com country, but at first about a dozen, say, of, of Statutes, regulations, court decisions, advocacy initiatives, research, uh, important news stories, all of the above, and we will be amassing them and putting them up on the website. Next year, in my project-based learning quiz, this is what I was talking about before, I'm going to have about half a dozen students, I guess, and each student, after we kinda, I kind of teach people what's going on, each student is going to be assigned one or two nations, and you're then going to be in charge of going to, I don't mean, you're not going to be traveling on New York Law School money, I don't mean that, going to, symbolically, going to, say, the Philippines or Cambodia and finding out what cases have there been, what statutes have there been, who is there in the Philippines who's doing this work, and then gathering it all together, and by the spring of 2014, we should have created something that is more than anyone else in the world has, which is really, really cool. You know, and not just cool, it's really, really valuable. It's valuable and very fascinating. Um, Professor Pearl, I'm sorry, that's all we have time okay. for today, but thank you so much for stopping by. My pleasure. It's Professor Michael Perlin at New York Law School. And thank you for watching Media Reporter. I'm Nicole Israel. Have a great evening. The fastest half hour of my life. Incredibly, it was so much Whoa. information. <laughs>